You're listening to the free ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now ad-free, go to intohistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at intohistory.com. It's March 10th, 1849 on 2nd Street in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a damp, drizzly day, but the rain has mostly subsided and the streets are bustling. Two men, Francis Blair, a writer for the Missouri Republican, and his brother Montgomery, weave their way through the crowd with umbrellas in hand. Frank is all smiles, but his brother can't hide his scowl. (sighs) Speak your mind, Montgomery. Uh, It's not going to do me any good. You have something to say, so say it. You should be more careful with your words, Frank. I should be. That man called me a coward, a liar, and a slanderer in black and white. Well, you weren't exactly kind to Mr. Pickering either. Pickering is a blowhard. That's Loring Pickering, writer for the Daily Union, a rival newspaper. The two journalists are embroiled in a feud over a Missouri politician, Senator Thomas Hart Benton, a Democrat who recently came out against the expansion of slavery. If Pickering can use the Daily Union to attack Senator Benton, I can certainly use the Republican to defend him and his views on limiting the expansion of slavery. You started this. You attacked Pickering first, and then you challenged him to a duel. And he refused me. Coward. He refused you because your weapon of choice was a Bowie knife. No man in his right mind would have accepted such a challenge. A man of courage would. Montgomery grabs his brother by the arm, stopping him. You're lucky Pickering didn't accept your challenge. He was well within his rights. Every word I wrote is true, Montgomery. Pickering is doing the bidding of the slavers and conspiring to drive Senator Benton from office. I'm not suggesting you're wrong. I'm suggesting you be more careful. Worry too much, brother. As Frank and his brother continue their stroll, a man walking their way catches Montgomery's eye. It's lowering Pickering. Do not say a word, Frank. I've said all there is to say on the matter. I will pay him no mind at all. As Pickering passes them by, Frank restrains his tongue, but not his temper. He intentionally bumps into Pickering's shoulder. Pickering is livid. Mr. Blair, Mr. Pickering, you have bumped my shoulder, sir. You have bumped mine, sir. I demand to know why you would do such a thing. You demand to know, do you? Frank grips his umbrella tightly, raises it, and points it at Pickering. Here is my answer. Pickering staggers back a few feet puts his hand to his eye. As he pulls it back, it's covered with blood. He can't see. The details of what transpired in March of 1849 between Frank Blair and Loring Pickering are disputed. But this much is certain. In early March, in front of a slew of witnesses, these two titans of the Missouri newspaper industry wielded their umbrellas and exchanged blows. Six days later, as Frank Blair was leaving a meeting at the courthouse in St. Louis, a strange man stepped out from the shadows and greeted Blair loudly and aggressively. Blair brushed him off and kept walking, but the stranger followed him. A gunshot rang out, and then another. Frank pulled a pistol and returned fire as the failed assassin ran away into the darkness. An investigation revealed the identity of the shooter, Dr. Prefontaine, Loring Pickering's assistant editor. Pickering and his accomplice were indicted for assault. Both were acquitted. Blair was indicted for the attempted duel which violated Missouri law. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to one minute in jail and a $1 fine. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham. And this is American Elections Wicked Game. The feud between Francis Blair and Loring Pickering was demonstrative of a political reality in 1840s America. Slavery was tearing the country apart. Blair and Pickering were both from Missouri. 
both were at one point Democrats. But when Missouri Senator Democrat Thomas Hart Benton publicly expressed concerns over the expansion of slavery, a line was drawn, and the two journalists fell on opposite sides. Blair was a slaveholder from Kentucky, but over the years his views began to change. Ultimately, he came out against the expansion of slavery. In the 1848 election, Blair abandoned the Democrats and supported Martin Van Buren and the anti-slavery Free Soil Party. In the late 1840s, members from all parties, from all regions of the country, were beginning to realize that the issue of slavery threatened to rip the country apart at the seams. The task of keeping the country stitched together fell in large part to America's second accidental president. After the death of Zachary Taylor on July 9, 1850, Millard Fillmore became the 13th president of the United States and the second vice president in American history to succeed the office. At the time of his inauguration, the task before Fillmore was daunting, to keep the country united, Fillmore would walk a delicate line to try and forge consensus between two warring political factions. This is episode 17, 1852, Bursting at the Seams. It's April 17, 1850, in the Senate chamber in Washington, D.C. The issue on the table is the expansion of slavery. Compromise measures are being discussed, but today's political debate has been hijacked by a personal feud between Democratic Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, Democratic Senator Henry Stuart Foote of Mississippi. Benton has the floor. Gentlemen, this article is a falsehood. Benton holds up a newspaper for all of the Senate to see. He points angrily in Senator Foote's direction. From across the chamber, Foote tries to maintain his composure as Benton bellows gentleman of this chamber is playing fast and loose with the truth in the press. The gentleman from Mississippi has revised the account of our exchange here in this very chamber. For months, Benton and Foote have been at each other's throats, exchanging fiery words over the subject of slavery on the Senate floor. Foote is in favor of slavery's expansion. Benton is against it. But the political disagreement has turned personal. Among accusations of corruption and treason, the two men called each other cowards. And now, Benton is accusing Foote of lying to the press about their feud. This is a wrong report, gentlemen. It is a false report, and it is a cowardly report. Benton wraps up his diatribe and takes a seat. From across the chamber, Senator Foote rises to defend himself. My fellow senators, to attack my character is one matter. To attack the character of the late Senator Calhoun is another. Senator and former Vice President John C. Calhoun was a champion of slavery from South Carolina and died just weeks ago. His remains are still in Washington, but that didn't stop Benton from attacking Calhoun and calling him a traitor. An attack on Senator Calhoun is an attack on this entire body and an attack on the Southern character. As Foote makes this argument, Benton stares daggers at him. Days ago, Benton sent Foote a clear message through an intermediary. If Foote invoked his name on the Senate floor, there would be hell to pay. As Foote continues his retort, Benton watches and waits. Senator Calhoun was the father of the Senate, indeed, the oldest member of the Senate, and he deserved more than the disrespectful report given him by Mr. Benton. At the sound of his name, Benton snaps. He flings his chair to the floor and leaps to his feet. Order! Order! As Benton angrily makes for Mr. Foote, several senators block his path, but Foote, too, charges for Benton. Benton climbs onto a nearby table in defiance. He rips open his shirt, bares his breast, and roars, Let him fire! Stand out of the way and let the assassin fire if you will! Another group of senators try their best to restrain Foote. Among them, Senator Dickinson of New York. Dickinson grabs Foote by the collar. Stand down, Mr. Foote! By God, I will not! Benton cries out, I'm unarmed! If the assassin intends to kill me, let him do it! Foot shoves Dickinson off him, powers through the sea of senators, and makes his way to the table where Benton stands. The two men lock eyes. A brief hush falls over the chamber. There's a moment of stillness. Then Benton makes a sudden move towards Foot. Foot draws a pistol, points it at Benton, and pulls back the hammer. Senator Dickinson approaches Foot cautiously. Put down the gun, Senator. I will not. As Foot boils with rage, Benton's eyes widen with fear. Dickinson speaks in a low, calm voice and slowly moves towards Foote. This is not the way, Mr. Foote. This is, this is not the way. Dickinson's voice seems to calm Foote's rage. Stand down. Foote breaks his gaze with Benton for a split second. Dickinson lifts his hand toward Foote's gun. Will you hand me your weapon? Foote nods silently. 
Dickinson gently takes the pistol from his hands. As Vice President Fillmore brings the chamber back to order, the senators return to their seats in shock. Senator Dickinson places Foote's pistol in his desk drawer and locks it away. Catastrophe has nearly been avoided. But the sectional and inter-party conflicts surrounding the issue of slavery are just beginning. The Foote-Benton standoff, like the Blair-Pickering confrontation, showed that the divisions over slavery were not purely partisan. The issue pitted Whig against Whig, Democrat against Democrat. These tensions had been simmering for decades. In the wake of the Mexican-American War, which ended in 1848, the issue of slavery's expansion had risen to the forefront. America had gained two massive new territories, Alta California and Nuevo Mexico, as well as all disputed territory in Texas. These Mexican states incorporated all or parts of what is today California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. But the question was, would these territories or the states that would later be carved from them allow slavery or would they be free? Southerners in both parties largely supported the expansion of slavery. Northerners largely opposed it. In the 1848 election, Whig President Zachary Taylor had mostly avoided the issue of slavery on the campaign trail. His silence is golden strategy was effective enough to put him in the White House, but Taylor had done little in the way of easing the growing sectional tensions. He had failed to bring the pro- and anti-slavery factions to the negotiating table, leaving the issue in the hands of a divided Congress. Ultimately, that Congress would forge a compromise, but it came at a cost. After President Taylor's death in July, the Compromise of 1850, as it would come to be known, would land on the desk of Taylor's vice president, Millard Fillmore. The Compromise was actually five separate bills. The first admitted California without slavery. The second and third drew boundaries for New Mexico and Utah, admitting both territories under a popular Democratic position called popular sovereignty, which left the question of slavery to the people, not the federal government. The fourth bill outlawed slave auctions in Washington, D.C. The last bill, known as the Fugitive Slave Act, was the most controversial of all. It gave southern states the power to retrieve escaped slaves who fled to the north. Whigs in the South, or cotton Whigs, largely supported the compromise, as did many northern Democrats. But anti-slavery Whigs in the North, or conscience Whigs, largely opposed it, as did pro-slavery Democrats in the South. This strange political alignment created a pressure cooker in Washington. At the time Fillmore took the oath of office, the Compromise of 1850 was tied up in Congress, caught in a web of never-ending debates. Fillmore did everything in his power to help push the measure through, though. And in late July, Fillmore appointed a new Secretary of State, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, a prominent Northern Whig. Together, Fillmore and Webster worked behind the scenes, dangling federal dollars over the heads of anti-compromise congressmen and threatening to withhold funds if they didn't get on board. In the end, their efforts paid off. Enough conscience Whigs in the North abstained from voting to get the compromise bill onto Fillmore's desk. By the end of September of 1850, with Fillmore's signature, the Compromise of 1850 was the law of the land. Fillmore was ready to declare victory to call the compromise the final answer on the question of slavery. But all across the country, members of both parties pushed back, especially in Fillmore's home state of New York. In 1850s America, two Whigs held the reins of power in New York. Senator William Henry Seward and a man named Thurlow Weed, a powerful newspaper editor who used the press to push his agenda. Both men were conscience Whigs, and both had been thorns in Fillmore's side for years. While Fillmore was vice president, Weed had attacked him in the press and Seward in the Senate. Both men had opposed Fillmore and the compromise every step of the way. When the news of President Taylor's death broke in July of 1850, Weed and Seward had cause for concern. The vice president they had spent over a year attacking for his conduct in the Senate was now the most powerful politician in America. With Fillmore occupying the highest office in the land, Seward and Weed braced themselves for Fillmore to use the powers of the presidency to seek retribution. But Fillmore never did. He did not weaponize federal patronage or dismiss Seward-friendly political appointees. Instead, he sought an alliance. As President, Fillmore was determined to be everyone's president, even those with whom he disagreed. He sought to ease sectional tensions and keep the country and the Whig Party united. After signing the compromise, instead of punishing his two adversaries from New York, 
Fillmore sought to bring them into the fold, asking them to support the compromise or at least remain silent on the subject. Seward and Weed gave lip service to Fillmore's peace offering, but behind the scenes, they continued to work to undermine the compromise, and they set in motion what might be called a political coup in New York. On September 27, 1850, New York Whigs held a state convention in Syracuse. President Fillmore sent his surrogates with a single goal, keep the peace with Seward's faction at all costs and focus on the larger objective, securing New York's support for the Compromise of 1850. The state of New York was a hotbed of anti-slavery sentiment, and for Fillmore, it was essential that the rest of the country see New York set aside those views and back the Compromise. Fillmore was optimistic, but he was not naive to the possibility that Seward's men would resist his agenda, and Seward's faction held a majority in New York. They could control the outcome of the convention, and so Fillmore dispatched a New York congressman named William Dewar with an olive branch, a moderate platform that would appeal to Seward's conscience Whigs. The platform endorsed the compromise, but it also stated that slavery would almost certainly be prohibited in the new territories in question, and that, as president, Fillmore would do his best to achieve that outcome. Early on, things seemed to go well. A pro-Fillmore, pro-compromise delegate named Francis Granger was named chair of the convention, and a pro-compromise man won the party's nomination for the New York governorship. But when Congressman Dewar introduced Fillmore's platform, Seward's faction pushed back. During the debate over the party platform, a delegate from Seward's district offered a substitute resolution. It stated that in the new territories, Congress had an obligation to prohibit slavery on the first indication it might be made legal. The resolution was antithetical to the premise of the compromise, and for the Fillmore camp, it was a non-starter. But the delegate didn't stop there. He added a second resolution, asking the convention to formally thank William Seward for effectively representing the true views of New York in the Senate. This was a direct attack on Fillmore. Thanks to the Seward majority, the resolutions passed 70 to 40. And in the aftermath of the vote, chaos broke out. The convention chairman, Francis Granger, slammed down his gavel and stormed out of the hall, followed by 40 pro-compromise delegates. Immediately after, Fillmore received a wire. Affairs at a crisis. Convention split open. Another read, We have nailed the colors to the mast and will fight to the last for you and your administration. The line is drawn. Meanwhile, in the press, publisher Thurlow Weed came up with a pet name for the pro-Fillmore delegates. Silver Grays, a reference to Chairman Francis Granger's long locks of flowing gray hair. Fillmore wanted the Silver Grays to unite with Seward and the conscious Whigs, not make a dramatic exit. Though they had done so out of loyalty to Fillmore and the Compromise, in the wake of the Syracuse Convention, Fillmore was more concerned about their loyalty to the Whig party at large. Fillmore's hopes for party unity were dampened further when the Silver Grays announced their own state convention, set to take place in Utica, New York, on October 17th. The Silver Grays looked poised to leave the Whig Party, strike out on their own in the election of 1852. The Whigs were coming apart, and not just in New York, but all across the country. The prospects for unity were grim, and many Whigs would look to Fillmore to unite the party behind his candidacy in the upcoming election. But there was a complication. Fillmore did not want the job. He was ready to retire from public life and leave Washington for good. But there was one Washington Whig who desperately wanted the White House. Fillmore's Secretary of State, Daniel Webster. In the run-up to the 1852 election, these two allies would find themselves entangled in a political struggle for the future of the country and the very survival of the Whig Party. It's December 1851 at the White House. A servant leads a man named Dr. Thomas Foote through the maze of halls and corridors leading to the president's private study where Millard Fillmore will be waiting. Dr. Thomas is co-editor of the Whig-friendly Albany Register, a pro-Fillmore newspaper. With the election of 1852 less than a year away, the work of covering Washington politics never stops. But when the doctor received a presidential summons, he dropped everything and promptly made the trip to Washington. Inside the study, Fillmore sits by a fireplace, thumbing through a stack of official papers, trying his best to stave off the cold. Mr. President, the doctor is here to see you. Thank you. Close the door behind you. That will be all. Yes, Mr. President. How are you, Thomas? Quite well, old friend. How are you? Have a seat. 
The mood in the room is solemn as the doctor joins Fillmore by the fire. I received your letter. What can I do for you, Mr. President? Fillmore sighs, a deep, heavy sigh. It's clear he feels the weight of the office working on him. I'll not mince words, doctor. I've decided to withdraw from the presidential contest. The doctor's heart sinks. Mr. President. No, no. When I was called to this office, the country was agitated by political and sectional tensions. Patriots and statesmen alike looked to the future with apprehension, as did I. I felt then, and feel now, the great sense of responsibility that rests upon me. I have done all that I can do. You must stand, Mr. President. The party will fall without you, and I fear the country with it. On the day President Taylor passed, I made up my mind to finish his term and retire from public office. I've not wavered from that view since. Sir, if you withdraw, it will only give muster to those who oppose the compromise. Senator Webster has declared his intentions. Senator Webster cannot unite the Whigs. It's his life ambition. Webster is a poor, decrepit old man. His limbs can scarce support him. He has served the country and the Whigs faithfully. The man has earned the privilege. Sir, at the risk of flattery, no other president ever commenced his administration amid like storms. No other could look forward to a close more auspicious and serene. Fillmore is silent. He feels a sense of duty weighing on him. The doctor presses his case. I fear for the future of the nation, sir. If sectional peace is to come, it is entirely dependent on the integrity of the Whig party. The hopes of all good men rest on you, sir. Your withdrawal would leave us without a head. Your Yield to the wishes of your friends for the sake of the country. For 17 months, since the very day of his inauguration, Fillmore has wished for nothing more than retirement. But hearing the passionate case made by his friend, Fillmore sets aside his personal desires. He nods solemnly in acquiescence. You must stand, Mr. President. Will you stand? <sighs> I will stand, but I will do so in silence. A member of Fillmore's cabinet once said of him, when he had carefully examined a question and had satisfied himself that he was right, no power on earth could induce him to swerve from what he believed to be the line of duty. From the very beginning of his time in the White House, Fillmore had decided not to stand for re-election. A man of few words, he had largely kept that decision to himself. But in December of 1851, the impassioned plea of Dr. Foote helped change his mind. But there was another reason Fillmore agreed to stay in the race— the Silver Grays. After Francis Granger and the Silver Grays walked out of the Syracuse Convention, Fillmore had interceded and prevailed upon the Silver Grays to stay in the Whig Party and to support the outcome of the New York Convention. Fillmore had kept the New York Whigs together, but only by the skin of his teeth, and the fractures in the Whig Party were cropping up all over the country. If too many Whigs broke faith with the compromise and struck out on their own in support of third-party candidates, not only would it threaten the survival of the Whig Party, it would undoubtedly hand the election of 1852 to the Democrats. By December of 1851, the upcoming presidential contest was already front and center. As one Whig senator from New York wrote, the political cauldron is beginning to warm. The ingredients which Macbeth's witches used for their hell broth were not more infernal than those which are being thrown into the mess now preparing. While Fillmore reluctantly dipped his toes into this cauldron, his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, had already jumped in head first. Of the presidency, Webster had once proclaimed, It is the greatest office in the world, and I am but a man, sir. I want it. I want it. Webster was in his twilight years, but his decades of public service had earned him the esteem of many in his party. In November of 1851, Webster's supporters had officially announced his candidacy for the Whig nomination. But to win his party's nomination, Webster would likely need the support of another aging Whig, Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, the de facto founder of the Whig party and a chief architect of the Compromise of 1850. Unfortunately for Webster, Clay was already committed to another candidate. In December of 1851, Clay arrived in Washington and checked into the National Hotel. He was old, feeble, and in poor health. President Fillmore visited him twice over the course of the next few months and paid his respects to the dying statesman. Though the two men had not always agreed on every issue, party loyalty united them, as did the Compromise of 1850. Before making the journey from Kentucky to Washington, Clay had publicly endorsed Fillmore, and during his time in D.C., Clay launched a letter-writing campaign from his deathbed on Fillmore's behalf. In March of 1852, Clay wrote a prominent Whig, 
The foundation of my preference is Fillmore. He has been tried in the elevated position he now holds, and I think that prudence and wisdom had better restrain us from making any change without the necessity for it, the existence of which I do not perceive. But while Clay sought to unite the party around Fillmore, William Seward and the conscience Whigs of New York sought to tear him down, calling Fillmore a traitor not just to the party, but to the country. The Seward Whigs portrayed Fillmore as a man who had been bitten by the presidential bug and who would do anything to maintain his grip on power. Their main point of attack against Fillmore was his support of the Compromise of 1850 and specifically the Fugitive Slave Act. William Seward, Thurlow Weed, and their anti-slavery faction wanted nothing to do with Fillmore or Webster. Both were compromised men. Both had sold their party out to Southern interests. So instead, Seward's faction set their sights on a different candidate, General Winfield Scott, a New York resident and a veteran of both the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War. Scott's candidacy had begun the moment President Taylor died. Scott had personally organized and led the military escort to the late president's body. After Taylor's death, Scott moved from New York to Washington to offer his services to the Fillmore administration. Scott was a supporter of the Compromise, but unlike Webster and Fillmore, he was not seen as the principal instigator. Scott's moral views on slavery were much more palatable to Seward's factions. Not to mention, his military pedigree made him a strong contender on the national field. Scott's service on the battlefields had earned him several nicknames, Old Fuss and Feathers, a reference to his insistence on military etiquette, and the Grand Old Man of the Army, a nod to his decades of service. And so the Whigs had three strong options, the President, the Secretary of State, and the General-in-Chief of the U.S. Army. In April of 1852, with the convention a few months away, the outcome was uncertain. Dr. Foote wrote to Fillmore, Your chances for nomination are better than anyone else if the South will be nearly unanimous. But the defection of the South from the Whig party would be fatal. But can you or any Whig be elected? I have great doubts. It depends on the Democrats. Dr. Foote knew that the Democratic convention was set to take place on June 1st in Baltimore. The Democratic field was just as crowded and the party just as divided as the Whigs. Four prominent Democrats sought the nomination. Lewis Cass of Michigan, the party's nominee in 1848. William Marcy, Secretary of War under President James K. Polk, and two stars in the Democratic Party, Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas and former Secretary of State James Buchanan. But in the midst of the crowded field, there was a dark horse candidate whom almost no one saw coming, not the Whigs and not the Democrats. His name was Franklin Pierce. In January of 1852, at the New Hampshire Democratic State Convention, the convention chairman had put Pierce's name forward, saying it was worthy of a high place among the names of the eminent citizens who will be conspicuously before the National Democratic Convention. Pierce had responded in the New Hampshire Patriot, writing, The use of my name in any event before the Democratic National Convention at Baltimore would be utterly repugnant to my tastes and wishes. Pierce's desire to stay out of the race was not about politics. It was about his family specifically his wife, Jane Means Appleton of Amherst, New Hampshire. The story of Franklin and Jane Pierce is a tragic tale that began decades before the 1852 election. Franklin Pierce and Jane Appleton had met in 1827 during Pierce's time in law school. They were an unlikely pair. Jane was often described as plain, quiet, and shy. Pierce, gregarious, striking, and handsome. Jane came from a wealthy Federalist family. She deeply despised tobacco, alcohol, and politics. Pierce, a stalwart Democrat, was a notorious drunk who would struggle with alcohol his entire life. In spite of their differences, Pierce and Jane had married in November of 1834. Their life together would be marred by tragedy. They had lost two sons, one in infancy, the other at the age of four. Jane, constantly plagued by illness and grief, had spent most of her time in New Hampshire while Pierce was serving in Washington, first in the House of Representatives and later in the Senate. Jane's hatred of politics deepened when, in February of 1838, Pierce had been caught up in a duel between two congressmen. On February 24, 1838, Kentucky Congressman William Graves had shot and killed Maine Congressman Jonathan Siley. Pierce had been publicly accused of goading Siley into the duel. Guilt-ridden, Pierce had once again turned to the bottle, and Jane had reached her wit's end. She had written a relative, Oh, how I wish he was out of political life. How much better it would be for him on every account. Pierce had gotten the message. In late February of 1842, a full year before the end of his term, 
Pierce had resigned his congressional seat to spend more time with Jane and their third child, a newborn son named Benny. Pierce had promised Jane that he would stay out of politics and focus his time and energy on their family. But by April of 1852, Pierce was again feeling the pull of Washington. In the run-up to the election, Pierce would break his promise to his wife and step back into the political spotlight. The cost to Pierce and his family would be tremendous, and the results, tragic. In April 1852, Franklin Pierce's friends in New Hampshire wrote to him imploring him to stand as a nominee. Pierce was a doughface, a northern man with southern principles. He saw abolitionism as an existential threat to the Union. For many Democrats, this made Pierce an ideal candidate. In April, newspaper editor Edmund Burke offered up a winning strategy. Keep Pierce's name off the ballot. Let the frontrunners attack and weaken each other. And then, when the moment is right, make their move. Pierce responded, If you and my other discreet friends think that the pride of our state, the success of our cause, can be subserved by the use of my name, then you must judge for me in view of all the circumstances. Pierce was in, but he told no one, not even his wife Jane. The Democratic National Convention began on Wednesday, June 1, 1852, in Baltimore. Three days and 33 ballots later, no one was close to the required two-thirds majority. The convention was at a stalemate. On the 34th ballot, the friends of Pierce made their move and threw his name into the ring. Their dark horse strategy worked. First, Virginia defected, then New Hampshire and Maine. By the 49th ballot, Pierce had 202 votes. The rest of the candidates had a combined total of five. Jane was despondent at her husband's victory. During the convention, Pierce and his wife had traveled to Boston. On a leisurely carriage ride, a horseback rider brought Pierce word from Baltimore he had won the nomination. Upon hearing the news, the story goes, Jane fainted on the spot. Pierce pledged himself to a pro-compromise platform. And when the party's frontrunners, Buchanan, Cass, Douglas, and Marcy, threw their support behind Pierce, the rest of the party followed suit. Northern and Southern Democrats alike rallied around Pierce with a brand new campaign slogan, We poked you in 1844. We shall pierce you in 1852. As the Democrats came together, the Whigs were on the verge of falling apart. The Whig National Convention was also held in Baltimore on June 16th. The weather was hot, humid, and dreary, reaching into the 90s. Thousands of spectators flooded into the hall to watch the drama unfold. A large banner hung above the stage, Liberty and Union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Another banner read, The Union of the Whigs for the sake of the Union. And for a while, union seemed possible. Two days into the convention, Fillmore scored a massive victory when the Whigs vindicated his administration and adopted a pro-compromise platform. But the first ballot revealed a divided party. Fillmore and Scott had just over 130 votes each. Webster had 29. Fillmore cared about the compromise, not the nomination. He had sent a delegate named George Babcock to Baltimore with instructions. The letter in Babcock's pocket read, Present to the presiding officer of the convention, whenever you deem it proper, the enclosed letter, withdrawing my name. In the letter, Fillmore asked Babcock not to suffer his name to be dragged into a contest for a nomination which I have never sought. But Babcock ignored Fillmore's instructions, and Fillmore's name remained on the ballot till the bitter end. During the convention, Daniel Webster was in despair. His decades of public service had only garnered him a handful of votes. His pride was wounded, But Webster also knew that if he withdrew, his delegates would decide the winner. Days into the convention, he accepted the inevitability of defeat and wrote to President Fillmore, I have sent a communication to Baltimore this morning to have an end put to the pending controversy. I think it most probable you will be nominated before one o'clock. Fillmore replied, I had intimated to my friends a strong desire to have my name withdrawn. Your communication may be too late. Fillmore was right. Webster was wrong. His supporters did not back the president. They backed General Winfield Scott. On the 53rd ballot, Scott secured the Whig nomination with Secretary of the Navy William Graham as his running mate. When Webster heard the news, his reply was, how will this look to history? But most in the present were asking how it will look to the Whig party. 
Unlike the Democrats, after their convention, the Whigs fractured into pieces. Five separate third parties ran candidates of their own, most stealing chunks of the Whig vote. In August, the anti-compromise Free Soil Party nominated New Hampshire Senator John Parker Hale. Also in August, the Union Party nominated Daniel Webster. Webster received a second nomination, too, from the so-called Know-Nothing Party, an anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, nativist faction. On August 25th, the Southern Rights Party, a radical pro-slavery faction, held a convention in Montgomery, Alabama, and nominated Georgia Senator George Troop. And in September of 1852, the Liberty Party, largely made up of abolitionists, held a convention in Syracuse and nominated reformer William Goodell of New York. In the election of 1852, the Whig and Democrat platforms were largely indistinguishable. Both were pro-compromise, and both offered a similar economic agenda. In the end, it came down to a question of party unity. The Democrats had it, the Whigs did not. In 1852, Pierce delivered Scott the most crushing electoral defeat of any Whig nominee in American history. Scott carried only four states and a meager 27 electoral votes, save for the Liberty Party's John Parker Hale, who earned a tiny fraction of the popular vote. None of the third party candidates secured a single electoral vote. Though Pierce handedly won the election with 254 electoral votes, his victory would be bittersweet. Before he was sworn in as America's 14th president, tragedy struck at the core of Washington and at the heart of the Pierce family. It's January, 1853, just outside Andover, Massachusetts. President-elect Franklin Pierce sits in a train car next to his wife, Jane. His 11-year-old son, Benny, sits on a bench behind them. Benny stares out the window, a sad expression over his face. Timidly, he leans forward and asks his father, How much longer? We're only about a mile outside of Andover. Concord is still a ways away. How much longer? Patience, Benny. It's a short trip. It won't be long now. The Pierce's train is bound for Concord, New Hampshire. They're returning from Boston where they attended the funeral of Jane's uncle, Amos Lawrence. The boy is despondent over Amos's death. Pierce turns back to the boy. Your Uncle Amos cared for you very much. You know that, don't you? Benny turns away and stares out the window. Pierce can tell the boy is hurting, but he doesn't know what to say. Jane nudges Pierce and sends him a stern but silent message, say something. Pierce sits beside his son and does his best to comfort the boy. Do you like the train? I've always liked the train. They have plenty of trains in Washington. At the word Washington, Benny recoils. Pierce starts to console him. Benny, but he stops himself short. Jane clears her throat. Pierce decides to give it another try. You'll like it in Washington, Benny. It's nice there. You'll make plenty of new friends, I have no doubt. It's as good a place as any, you'll see. Pierce tussles his son's hair, goes back to sit with Jane, who takes his hand in hers. As the train roars down the track, Pierce can't stop thinking about a letter Jane recently showed him, a letter Benny wrote before the election. Pierce can't get Benny's words out of his head. He wrote to his mother, I hope he will not be elected, for I should not like to be at Washington, and I know you would not either. But Benny's view on Washington will never be known. Their train never makes its destination. Just over a mile outside of the Andover station, Pierce's train derailed and tumbled down a 20-foot embankment. Pierce, who was sitting next to Jane, was badly bruised, but he and his wife survived the crash, as did all the rest of the passengers. There was only one fatality, Benny. He was nearly decapitated right in front of his parents' eyes. Distraught, Jane did not attend Benny's funeral, nor did she attend Pierce's inauguration. She blamed politics for Benny's death, believing that God was punishing her husband. At his inauguration, Pierce refused to place his hand on the Bible, believing God had cursed him for his past sins. For the rest of his life, Pierce would drown his sorrows in alcohol, ultimately succumbing to liver failure years later. For Washington, the election of 1852 was surrounded by tragedy. On June 29th, Whig founder Henry Clay had died. A few months later, in October, Daniel Webster had passed as well. It might be said that the passing of Clay and Webster marked the symbolic end of the Whig party. It brought the death of what was often called the second two-party system. The 1852 contest was the last presidential election in which the Whigs were a true national force. 
And in the run-up to the 1856 contest, Franklin Pierce and the Democrats would have to contend with another political party, a new party that would rise to almost immediate national prominence, a party that would put 19 of the next 29 presidents in the White House. In 1856, for the first time, the Democrats would face off against the Republicans. This is episode 17 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1852, Bursting at the Seams. On the next episode, the election of 1856, after sectional tensions take a violent turn, Democrats abandon Franklin Pierce and prepare to pit James Buchanan against John Fremont, the first ever candidate of the newly formed Republican Party. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Stephen Walters. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck. 